as you know, dear friends, we are all about bringing on the fully automated gay space communism here at the Gay Thieves Manifesto. We work diligently each week to undermine traditional morality and tear at the fragile glue of society by suggesting that, yes, us queer and trans folk are people too, and that we might also be entitled to live our lives happily and with the same access to society that the majority enjoys. We are such idealists here. But... Until we put ourselves out of work by fixing the giant festering sore that is the current political climate, we're going to need your help to keep doing our thing. Check out patreon.com slash Manifesto and consider a per episode donation to support our activism and help us do more to provide some love and support to this community that pretty desperately needs it right now. Helping us tear at the fragile fabric of civilization this week are Sean, the Wayward Willis podcast, Jeff, Madeline, and Christopher. Thank you all so dearly for helping us do what we do. We love and appreciate each and every one of you. Your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. This is the Gay Atheist Manifesto. Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the Gay Atheist Manifesto. I am your host, Callie Wright, and I am super, super interested in the conversation we're going to have today. So uh, a concept that I've heard more and more talk about lately is the idea of a universal basic income. And folks on the left generally see it as a way to promote income equality, uh, and in poverty, and it even has support in some conservative and libertarian circles as an alternative to welfare programs. I am super intrigued by the idea, and it sounds in principle like something that I can get behind, but I have questions. So, to answer those questions, we have joining us Michael Howard. Michael is a professor of philosophy at the University of Maine and a coordinator of the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network, and he is here to school us on the universal basic income. Welcome to the show. Uh, happy to be here. So, I guess the logical place to start, why don't you take a minute and just lay out exactly what is a universal basic income? All right. Um, universal basic income is a periodic cash payment that goes to every citizen or resident. Um, it's universal. It goes to poor and wealthy alike. Uh, it's not means tested. Uh, it's unconditional. It doesn't depend on any behavior or work requirement or willingness to work. Uh, and it's individual. It goes to every person. It's not based on households. It's quite a different way of structuring cash payments and income security than what's typical in modern welfare states. Yeah. And, and an important distinction is that this is a cash payment, right? So we're not talking about something like food stamps where it's like you get a certain amount of food or you get like a, a housing allowance or something like that. Like this is literally cash to do with what you see as appropriate. And that's an important distinction, right? That's right. A basic income is much less paternalistic. It, uh, one of the premises behind it is that people are pretty good judges of what their own needs are. And, and if we just give them cash, they'll make the best use of it. And can you talk about the history of this concept? Because this is not a new invention, right? That's right. Depending on how tightly or loosely you define a basic income, you can trace it back a long time. But probably the, the first modern proposal goes back to the 18th century, when Thomas Paine, uh, the author of Common Sense, and one of the leaders in the American Revolution, um, went to France and he wrote a, a pamphlet called Agrarian Justice, where he proposed that the state should impose a tax on land, which at that point in time was already in France, owned by a fairly small part of the population. Uh, so the tax should be imposed on land to compensate people who were excluded from land ownership. And it would take the form of a, of a lump sum payment that people would receive when they reached a certain age. And then when they reached 50, they would get um, a pension for the rest of their lives. So that's the first sort of beginning of the idea. And then in the 20th century, you've had the philosopher Bertrand Russell proposing a, a small cash payment that everybody would get that would enable them to um, either live very modestly, a life of leisure, or uh, to ensure that they wouldn't fall into poverty. And it's, um, it's also been proposed by uh, conservative economist Milton Friedman, a slightly different variant of the basic income is what's called a negative income tax. And the, the main difference is that the negative income tax is means tested. It only goes to people who, uh, who are in need of cash assistance. Uh, and it's phased out as they begin to uh, 
bring in earnings from other sources. Um, the interest in in basic income or guaranteed income or or uh, negative income tax peaked in uh, the late 1960s and early 70s. Uh, and George McGovern, when he ran for president, had a demo grant proposal, which was very similar to basic income. Uh, Richard Nixon had a kind of watered down version called the family assistance plan, which was a variation of the negative income tax. And it never made it through the Senate. Uh, and then it kind of died away for quite a number of years. Um, and then it began to be revived uh, 20 some years ago. That's when the, the basic income European network was formed. It's uh, since it changed its name to a basic income earth network and U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network is the U.S. affiliate of that organization. Um, and the next time around now, I think what's been driving it is in part the recognition that um, the means-tested and uh, behaviorally required forms of welfare are not working. We still have large numbers of people in poverty. Um, and there's also the concern that um, it's increasingly difficult to for modern economies to guarantee everybody a full-time job with a wage that is livable. So the idea of a basic income is to ensure income security on top of which people would earn, earn income from wages. Yeah. Well, and, and so this is you know part of a proposed solution to it, it, jobs that are increasingly automated, right? The idea being that, you know, robots and automation, there are fewer jobs and the jobs that are left are generally the creative ones. And people like me who do podcasts understand that that doesn't generate the level of income that a, that a more traditional sort of job. And so this would be uh, this would be sort of one, uh, a part of a package of solutions to that issue. Exactly. You know, there's a big debate about um Automation. Historically, we've had several waves of automation from the steam engine to, uh, you know, other forms of technology that have eliminated large categories of work. Uh, but the uh, economies have always generated more jobs than they've been displaced. And so the, the you know, the central question is, is this time different? Uh, are we going to have uh, more jobs eliminated than will be replaced by new sorts of opportunities. Um, and a couple of things that lead some people to think that it is different is that this time automation is eliminating not only muscle power, but brain power. And there's not too much left for people to do if you eliminate jobs in both of those categories. Right. So the, the problem is not necessarily automation, but more uh, the problem of artificial intelligence and being able to make those slightly more creative decisions and intelligent decisions that previously only only people could do. Yeah. Um, now, you know, there may be uh, forms of work that can never be automated or never fully automated. Um, care work. Uh, I mean, there are some things being done. You know, you can have robots that like, you know, your Siri and these other sort of bots on your phone that can sort of talk to you. But I don't think that will ever be, for most people, a, a satisfactory replacement for human care. Um, and also creative work. Uh, you can you can get computer generated music, but or, or you can get computers to generate text. But are they ever going to be genuine expressions of human thought and emotion? and thus really of interest to human audiences. So it, it may be that, you know, as, as uh, other forms of production become cheaper because of automation, there will be increased opportunities for people to do creative work that hitherto hasn't been compensated very much. But uh, at least in the transition, it may be essential that we, we provide income security for people to, um, to do what they want to do and, um, uh, and to be able to survive. Yeah, and, and I want to sort of explore this idea of it being means tested, right? The idea being that, you know, uh, under some proposals, you get this payment if you fall below a certain income level. So that's one in one way or another, kind of the welfare that we have now. And the argument that I've read against that about, uh, you know, it being means tested is that uh, there are some ways in which our current welfare system create a disincentive to work, right? Because if you get a minimum wage job, 
you know, you, that disqualifies you from some of these forms of welfare and you're in, you're really in no better position and you lose the assistance. And, and, and so it's not really a satisfactory replacement and removing the means test removes that disincentive. Is that, is, am I reading that right? Yeah. And I think it's useful also to distinguish the means test from other forms of conditionality. So one of the additional features that traps people in poverty is that they have to be searching for a job uh, or they have to do other things that um, once, they, once they don't do that, they lose their benefit. Um, and if they take on a job, uh, as you rightly pointed out, um, they, if they immediately lose the benefit, then they're giving up something secure, the welfare payment, or something that's uncertain, which is the income from what might be a fairly precarious job. So they, they stay with the safe bet, which is to stay in poverty on welfare. So if you remove the means test, you have the basic income. Even if you're making a million dollars, you're getting the basic income. It's most important for people at the low end of the income category where every dollar they earn, they keep. Whereas if you, the system is designed so that you, every dollar you earn, you lose a dollar in welfare, then there's really no incentive to work. You can partly address that by uh, phasing out the benefit. That's how a well-designed negative income tax would work. You, you might be able to keep um, every 75 cents of, of a dollar you earn. Well, you earn a dollar and you only give up 25 cents of your negative income tax until you reach a certain level where it phases out entirely. But there's still some disincentive built even into that. Right. Something that really surprised me when I was doing some reading about this is uh, to learn that they're actually conservative and libertarian leaning folks who support this, at least in some forms. Can you help me understand what the appeal is from that uh, from that point of view? Because, you know, in my mind, I just hear like welfare for all socialism, communism and like all of the things that make them really mad. <laughs> so like <Yeah>. can, <laughs> from that side of the from that side of the view, what, what, what's the uh, what's the incentive there? Uh, the devil is in the details. There are. As people hear about basic income, they should uh, press on the question of what what level is it set at and what is given up in the process of instituting it. So Milton Friedman, for example, what he wanted to um, introduce a negative income tax and abolish virtually every other aspect of the welfare state. Now, depending on the level of basic income or or negative income tax that people would be given, that could be a very bad deal for people in poverty because they might lose in medical benefits, um, in heating assistance, in unemployment benefits, and a whole range of other things. They might lose more than they get in the the cash payment. Um, Charles Murray, for example, a more recent libertarian proponent of basic income, Charles Murray proposes that um, everybody should get a basic income of $10,000 a year. However, he wants to do away not only with other forms of cash payment, but with uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And he would require everybody to use $3,000 of their 10,000 to purchase health insurance. So when you add it all up, it's not a good deal. Uh, so the kind of basic income we want is one that preserves important in-kind benefits that the modern states provide, like universal health care in countries that have it, and uh, universal public education and publicly funded universities. If you take all those away and put everything on the market, then people with only a basic income are not going to be able to afford them. Well, and that brings us to cost, right? So, you know, one common objection and one that that I'm genuinely curious about is how you pull this off while preserving those other programs without bankrupting your country, right? Like, like I love the idea. I'm just curious how, how you afford this. Yeah. And so you have to ask, uh, what is going to be the tax base that will support this? And it's important to differentiate between uh, the net and the gross cost. 
by the gross cost. People who, who say, oh, this is completely impossible because of its cost, they just take uh, the number of people in the country, let's say roughly 300 million, and if the basic income were say, set at, least, let's say, $10,000 per year per person, just to use a number, uh, that's $3 trillion. Well, how could we afford that? That's the gross cost. Okay, let's suppose that you're funding this uh, by taxes on incomes. Remember, everybody's going to get $10,000 unconditionally. So whatever you were earning before, uh, that's now on top of $10,000. If you start, if you impose a, let's call it a surtax on earned income above the basic income, uh, you will tax back from income earners uh, more income as they earn more and more. Uh, and uh, up to the median or a little bit above, everybody will be financially better off with the basic income together with the additional taxes than will people who are above the median and increasingly as they get more wealthy, they will be net contributors rather than net recipients. Um, so even if you give the basic income to everybody, if you're incre increasing the taxes on the more uh, affluent part of the population, then um, the, the net cost turns out to be, well, it depends on the tax rate, but in one calculation I saw, it's, it turns out to be one-sixth uh, the cost of the gross cost. So instead of uh, three trillion, it's something more like 500 billion. It's like we spend, all right, but we spend more than that on the military, you know, right. so like, so that, that yeah. makes it a more doable number at least. <laughs> it certainly is. And, and that's, that's without making any other changes. So, uh, as you noted at the outset, there are lots of other cash payments that, uh, would be totally unnecessary with the basic income. There's no reason to have food stamps. February, everybody's getting $10,000 a year. So you eliminate food stamps. Uh, you could eliminate at least a sizable uh, portion of unemployment benefits because everybody would have basic income. Some people might need more than the basic income if they are laid off from a, uh, from a job. So, but unemployment benefits would top up the basic income, but the $10,000 per person would uh, be eliminated from that program. So, uh, you go across the board looking at all of those uh, income transfers we now have, you could reduce from 30, 300 billion quite a bit further by eliminating those redundant programs. And of course, there's going to be a lot of controversy about that. And But I think it's, it, uh, there would be some reasonable agreement that a lot of those programs could be eliminated uh, and everybody would still be better off with the new system. Yeah. Because that's one, you know, one argument that I read is that you know, in order to pay for this, obviously we might have to get rid of some programs that specifically target poor people, and since everyone gets the universal basic income, that that somehow amounts to an upward redistribution of wealth. Um, and, and I guess you know, if we're not eliminating literally all of those programs, and we're making you know making certain that it, it's a system under which everyone is slightly better off, I guess that I, I guess that eliminates that objection. Yeah. I mean, the, the point about targeting, people often say, well, if you've got a fixed amount of money to deal with poverty, it makes more sense to give it to the poor than to spread it out across the whole population. However, what that, that comment um, ignores is the, the point I was making earlier, that while it goes to everybody, uh, everybody who's earning money on top of the basic income is also paying taxes. So some will pay more in taxes than they will get in the basic income, and others will get more in basic income than they pay in taxes. But the targeting doesn't mean that you're just you know, throwing money at the rich who don't need it. Bill Gates is going to pay far more than $10,000 in taxes to support the basic income scheme than he's getting uh, with his basic income payment. So uh, it has the you know, a basic income, I mean, a, a negative income tax is targeted. It's means tested. Um, but financially speaking, when you consider the, the 
tax payments for the basic income uh, that people pay back, the net effect is the same. Uh, the same people will, will receive more income and pay less in taxes. Others will pay more in taxes and less in income with a negative income tax scheme versus a basic income scheme. The, the, the real difference is, is whether uh, uh, you send it to everybody or you just send it to the poor. And the results on taxes would be different accordingly. Another common objection that I read is that, you know, doing this is obviously a disincentive to work, right? Because, uh, you know, we need jobs because if we don't, we can't eat, we can't pay rent, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the argument is not only on the the moral level of, of, you know, people should just work because that's what people should do, but that this would lead to labor shortages and eventually hurt the economy. What's the uh, what's the, the, the argument there? Yeah. Let me first point out that people are already doing lots of work that is unrecognized and uncompensated. Uh, people are taking care of children, they're taking care of the elderly, they're doing important volunteer work in their communities, uh, and a basic income would make it a lot easier to do those jobs without you know, suffering from income insecurity. So part of what basic income is designed to do is to recognize and facilitate those kinds of activities. But as to the standard paid employment, um, it depends on the level at which the basic income is pitched. Uh, if you gave every individual $30,000 a year, it might have a catastrophic effect on um, the labor market. And you might have so many people withdrawing from employment that um, the amount of money available for basic income itself would decline. Um, but I don't think if you paid everybody $10,000 a year that most people are going to stop working because uh, most of us can't, um, can't live very well on $10,000 a year. We need a little more than that. Um, and we'd have quite a bit of incentive to work if, we, if our needs and our desires carry us beyond that bare minimum. Um, but you know, it's, it's something that prudently it would make sense to phase in gradually and see what the effects are. Um, and we do have some empirical evidence from, um, the guaranteed income experiments in the uh, 1960s and seventies in the U S and Canada. Um, in those experiments, uh, the one I'm most familiar with is in Dauphin, Manitoba, uh, and, uh, everybody in this town was eligible for uh, unconditional cash payments. And um, there was very little labor work market withdrawal. Uh, the only people who worked somewhat less were mostly uh, women with small children at home and high school student, people of high school age who had dropped out of high school to work and they stopped working and they went back to school. And arguably, both of those are socially desirable forms of labor market withdrawal. Uh, what you did not see is large numbers of people withdrawing just because they were lazy and had nothing else to do. Um, and we've seen the same in, in poor countries in India and in Namibia, where there have been basic income experiments. People uh, rather than becoming less productive, they became more productive because they now had some resources uh, to develop their talents, to provide some, some tools, to improve their um, sanitation facilities, their health. Uh, it's had lots of positive spinoffs and very little on the negative side. Well, yeah, I mean, I just have to imagine it lessens the stress, right? You're, you're just more yeah. secure in life. And so that leaves you, you know, even if you're not super financially secure, you're more financially secure. And so that leaves you more time and more space and more emotional resources to cultivate talents and things that you love. And so, I mean, I can imagine that having an incredibly huge uh, social benefit. Oh, sure. That's really the idea. And, and especially, you know, you hear, I mean, my generation, my parents' generation, you would get a job and you'd have it for a lifetime. And hardly anybody goes through that pattern nowadays. Um, and frequently you, uh, you may have multiple careers. You 
you reach the end of a certain line of work and you want to retool and the basic income is a, a sort of a guarantee that's there that it will enable you to take a semester to go and take some classes and, and become qualified to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. Yeah. And, you know, a huge change that I could picture happening with this, because what I see a universal basic income as doing is not necessarily a disincentive to work, but a disincentive to meaningless work. Um, yes. it, it makes you less obligated to do those things that people aren't socially in, or aren't engaged with in the first place. And yeah. so I can imagine that forcing employers like well if we want to do this business we have to make it we have to make it worth it for people to come to work for us so we have to make this a work environment that that's fun that's engaging that's fulfilling that people actually get something out of instead of saying well like look if you don't come to work you don't eat so you got to take what we give you exactly um in fact there are two important labor market effects that we might expect from a basic income. One is what you're just talking about and what some people have described as the uh, enabling people to say no to meaningless, uh, dangerous, demeaning, poorly paid work. Uh, and as you say, if, if people start refusing the worst kinds of jobs that are offered to them because they're the poorest and least skilled people in the economy, the most vulnerable. If those people can now uh, refuse some of those jobs, the employers will have to alter the, the conditions of work and make them better. And, and the most vulnerable people in our economy will be most benefited by that. The other kind of labor market effect is um, kind of the, on the flip side of it, that, there are now things that are, are very meaningful that people would like to do, but they can't afford to do them because there's not enough financial remuneration. Uh, you might want to take an internship, uh, you know, with a dance company or a theater company or, or some enterprise that, uh, at which you could learn some useful skills, but they don't have enough to pay you, a nonprofit corporation or something like that. And with a basic income, those kinds of meaningful employment uh, become a lot more feasible. So on the one side, the really undesirable jobs may be upgraded as a consequence of basic income, uh, and the wages could come up. And on the other side, the things people would do because of the intrinsic value of the work, uh, it's easier for them to fit those into their lives. And... Uh, be able to do work that they otherwise could do. Gosh, that's awesome. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to imagine the possibilities, you know, because, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, my day job, I work in a call center and I get yelled at about people's internet connections all day. Like that's, you know, that, that's what I get paid to do. And, um, yeah. you know, there are far worse ways to make a living for sure. But I mean, I am definitely not intellectually or emotionally stimulated by the work that I do. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so I could spend more time doing my podcast that I feel like actually does have meaning and, and does, you know, contribute some benefit to cer some, you know, certain segment of society. And I just, I am at, I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine a society in which, you know, most people, if not all people who want to make those contributions are now empowered to do so because they don't have to, you know, they don't have to put their meal ticket in jeopardy to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Gosh, that is huge. Well, you know, um, yeah, go ahead. What it's all, in a word, what this is all about, and I think this may partly explain why people on the libertarian right are somewhat drawn to it. What it's about is freedom. Um, we sometimes think of freedom too narrowly. We think of what we have legal rights to do. You know, you and I both have the legal right to engage in market transactions and become millionaires, but the actual likelihood of that happening is not very great because we don't have the resources and the wealth to, you know, ramp it up to that level. Um, but if you combine legal rights with material resources, then you greatly expand people's freedom. And it's particularly important for people who have almost no resources to begin with. People who are born in poverty, uh, who face gender or racial discrimination of various kinds, um, and they have nothing to fall back on. So 
a basic income is designed to to give uh, you know material uh, reality to the formal legal rights that uh, we all like to think we have. Gosh, I think I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, my next question is: is how how likely do you think we are to see something like this? I know uh, was it was it Sweden that overwhelmingly voted down a proposal to do this? And uh, Switzerland, Switzerland, Switzerland. Uh, yeah, and yeah. and I just you know, in, in our obviously in our current pol- political climate in the United States, I mean, it just it seems like such a hail mary to me. Like, wh- what do you think the possibility is of uh, of actually seeing something like this happen? Yeah, I hesitate to make a prediction. These things come about. Uh, in odd ways that are hard to predict. But, um, you know, just to, since you brought up the Swiss referendum, let me comment on that. Um, they had to get several hundred thousand signatures to get that on the ballot. And Switzerland is a country that uh, has a very robust constitution allowing for direct participatory democracy like this. So once they got those signatures, there had to be a referendum nationwide. And the legislature was required to debate it. Um, and although it, it was defeated by, I think it was less than 30% of the population voted for it. But uh, it was a higher percentage than was in favor of it when they started the campaign. And even people who were against it said, this is not uh, the end of the matter. This is just the beginning of the conversation. So I don't think the people who put it on the ballot expected it necessarily to win. They wanted to get everybody in Switzerland thinking about it, and they succeeded in doing that. Um, They also really uh, went for the most uh, extravagant kind of basic income. Um, They defined it as as an income adequate for basic needs and enabling a person to live a life of dignity. And although the referendum didn't specify a number, what was thrown around in the press uh, was something on the order of uh, what would be the equivalent of about $2,500 a month. So you figure over $20,000 a year. Um, that's a very extravagant basic income. Um, and I think a lot of people thought, well, we just can't afford that. Um, gotcha. So it's not that they were no. opposed to the concept. It was maybe that specific implement- implementation of it that they weren't a fan of. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, they, there, there were a lot. There are a lot. In other words, lots of possibilities between that sort of Cadillac plan and some things that are more modest as a starting point. Um, now, let me tell you about a success story, which really nobody could have predicted. Um, and in fact, it's the only place where there's a basic income that's been in place for any significant time period in the world, and that's Alaska. Uh, in the state of Alaska. Every person annually receives an unconditional cash payment, and it's averaged over $1,000 per year. It's been over 2,000 in some years. Um, And the money comes from uh, a sovereign wealth fund invested in stocks and bonds that was capitalized from the oil boom on Alaska's North Slope that still continues to generate revenue for the state of Alaska. and the, um, the, it's called the uh, Permanent Fund Dividend. Now, that dividend came about uh, through a very unusual coalescence of forces. It included Democrats in the legislature as well as Republicans and a very kind of visionary Republican governor who really liked this idea of having everybody in the state sort of co-own their oil wealth. Uh, and it continues to pay benefits and it will do so unless they change the law in Alaska. Uh, it's very popular and nobody says, oh, we shouldn't have this because we're giving people something for nothing. It's extremely popular. Um, now it's only a partial basic income. It's, it's not enough for one's basic needs, but, uh, um, it does show the potential uh, of such policy. And there are many other resources you could configure in that way. So you tax the resources, you put it in a fund and you pay out dividends to everybody. If you consider not only our national oil wealth, but also our electromagnetic spectrum, our 
our land rent, uh, our you know fees we could impose on financial transactions that don't serve any useful purpose but to make money out of money, things like that. You could you could generate a significant, at least partial, basic income on a national basis in the U.S. just on the basis of resource taxation. Gosh, well, that is good stuff. This has been a super yeah, interesting let me, conversation. Let me add to that. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Add to that, uh, just to show how close this has come to the political mainstream, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, in the book she wrote uh, about her political campaign, reveals that she seriously considered uh, something like the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend as a national policy. Uh, she was very interested in She read uh, Peter Barnes's book with Liberty and Dividends for All. Um, and she put people on her campaign to work studying it. And she says rather cryptically, we couldn't get the numbers to work. Uh, I would love to know what that meant. But um, whatever it meant, they, they dropped it. And she says, well, maybe I should have pushed it. You know, she thinks maybe if she'd been a little bolder and more progressive in some of her policies, she might have done better in the in the election. But in any case, the, my main point is that uh, here was a, uh, you know, one of the two leading contenders for the presidency, seriously considering a partial basic income as one of her, the key planks in her platform. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that demonstrates this is not some fringe out there idea. It's no longer on the fringe. That's right. Yeah. Well, this has been a super interesting conversation. I have learned a lot, and I think I feel like I've got some more reading to do. So uh, anyone who's listening who is interested, uh, are, are there any specific resources you can recommend to, to go out and learn more about this? Well, I can uh, mention uh, a couple of uh, important websites. Um, U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network, it's usbig.net. Uh, we have uh, discussion papers from conferences we've had for the last 15 or 20 years. Um, we have uh, uh, links. We have um, a news flash. You can join. It doesn't cost anything, and you'll get the news flash every month with the latest news around the world on basic income. So that's one resource. Uh, second resource is the Basic Income Earth Network. Uh, they also have a website with uh, you know academic papers from past conferences news items, uh, and other resources. Uh, there are some other basic income groups springing up in the U.S. Uh, basic Income Action is one. They're forming local chapters. Uh, basic Income America has, is, has a very useful website. Uh, there's a, a Universal Income Project that's doing uh, campaigning out in California. Uh, so, you know, check those things out and... Uh, and from there, you can be led to other things. Uh, there are quite a few uh, important books that have come out on basic income. Uh, one of the more recent ones is by Philippe von Parijs and Yannick von der Borch. It's just called Basic Income, A Radical Proposal for a Free Society and a Sane Economy. Um, and if you do uh, uh, Google searches, you can find uh, lots of other sources. Scott Santens is an interesting advocate of basic income. He's on our, our board at us big, um, and he has his own website and he has, uh, his own sort of pick of the best videos and the best books and articles on basic income. So you'll find what I mentioned and some other things there. Cool. Cool. I will link all of that in the show notes, Michael Howard. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for, thanks for teaching us and, uh, and thanks for the work that you do. I think this is good stuff. Well, thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed the conversation. And, uh, you know, people should feel free to contact me as well if they have any questions. Very cool. I will put your, I'll put your contact information in the show notes as well. Great. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gaytheist Manifesto. We are a proud member of the Trans Podcaster Visibility Initiative. We're a group of trans podcasting badasses working to bring more trans voices into podcasting and other content creation. Search for the Trans Podcaster Visibility Initiative on Facebook for more info. You can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Gaytheist Manifesto. You can email us at podcast at the Gaytheist Manifesto dot com. I'm on Twitter at Gaytheist Cali. You can find the show on Twitter at the Gaytheist and 
and we have a fancy brand spanking new website at thegatheistmanifesto.com where you can hear all the podcasts, hear the blog, read the blog. You read those. You don't hear those. Read the blog. And no Ari outro. I sincerely apologize. Uh, and Ari sincerely apologizes. And we'll, we'll get you on that one next week, I promise. If you want to support the show and the activism we do, you can head to patreon.com slash Manifesto and make a per episode donation as little as a dollar per episode. And if that's not doable, you can head over to iTunes, give us a five-star review that helps us get moved up in the rankings and heard by more people. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, if you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is The Atheist Manifesto.